out our Bibles. We'll start with Exodus 21. <clears throat> you won't have to stand here, but uh, just hold that spot and I'll be ready to turn there in a minute. So the title of the message tonight is, Who is in charge of your body? <laughs> and that came from <clears throat> really just hearing with the whole idea of the um, abortion situation, which, uh, you know, hey, hey, praise the Lord, I'm all for doing away with Roe versus Wade, and I hope everybody gets out there and votes, uh, you know, for our state. I know that our governor doesn't care to <clears throat> have that, uh, that kind of law there, so uh, she would be happy with. <clears throat> anyway, so the thing that keeps uh, coming up, though, that you've always heard is my body, my choice. And so, you know, I've even kind of, you know, we've even kind of backfired that a little bit when they were uh, trying to tell us that we had to wear a mask and do all, or get the vaccine or whatever. We're like, hey, my body, my choice, right? Because it's, it's just uh, it's convenient to be able to throw that back there. But the reality is, as I began to think about it, and maybe you thought about it as well, where does the Bible actually say that our body belongs entirely to us and we just have the right to choose to do whatever we want to our body. I mean, that's even just giving them the benefit of the doubt that the child in the womb is part of their body. I mean, obviously, you know, that's a womb. I mean, I just saw a meme here on Facebook a while back that, or just recently that said, uh, you know, one person was saying, a liberal, you know, person was saying that, you know, in, in future generations, they're going to have less rights than we have. And the other side said, well, I think the right to live, the right to be born is a good start, don't you? <laughs> right? So <clears throat> anyway, it's a, obviously a nation divided, a polarizing issue in some sense of the word. But look at Exodus 21. I've heard people use this as a, uh, as a scripture kind of backing up pro-life and against uh, abortion. I don't believe that it fits that. I'm not using it for or against abortion. That's not my point. I'm totally against abortion, in case you need to know. But there's a lot of other verses I can go to for that, like thou shalt not kill, like uh, God knowing, uh, knowing you, before, you know, before you were born, knowing you when you're in your mother's womb. Uh, so you already had, you know, God was, uh, you know, he knew you then. And, and you could go to places where, you know, John the Baptist leaped in the mother's womb in response to Jesus. I mean, there's a lot of things that you could pull out and say, like, there's no way that that's not a life. There's no way that God would approve of somebody killing that baby, regardless of what the uh, time frame is that it's been in the womb. But anyway, Exodus 21, verse 22, I just want to show you this because the point I'm making isn't even about uh, that, you know, abortion being wrong. I, I think everybody in here is in agreement with that. But it's the it's the the woman's body, okay, and how she it handles this situation. Wouldn't they liberals who are pro-choice love? I mean, not pro, yeah, pro-choice. Wouldn't they love to hear that the point that I'm making right here is actually the husband has the right to choose what goes on with the woman's body in a manner of speaking. Look at Exodus 21, verse 22. If men strive, of course, this is right after the Ten Commandments, and he's going to continue to give a whole lot of commandments, but some of them are just the judgments, like here's what you do if these certain rules, laws are broken or whatever. If men strive and hurt a woman with child, okay, so she's carrying a child, so that her fruit depart from her. Now he, hurt, somebody hurt this woman, you know, maybe he was fighting with her husband and she just got in the way or, or maybe not, maybe she just made him mad and, and he like hit her or whatever. And her fruit departs from her, meaning that she miscarries. She doesn't have the baby. And yet, no mischief follow. And I think the clear emphasis here is that nothing else happened to her other than the fact that she lost the baby. No marks, no broken bones, uh, nothing. But she did miscarry because of what this man did to her. He shall surely be punished according as the, uh, as the woman's husband will lay upon him. And this is talking about financial, like, payout, which we can see right here in the following part, and he shall pay as the judges determine. Okay, so the judges will decide whether what the husband's asking for is fair or not and make him pay uh, what, he, what he owes them for the damage that he's caused. And if any mischief follow, okay, 
Okay, so now you got the same situation. The woman has been hurt, but now it wasn't just the, the fact that she lost the baby, but something physically happened to her. Then thou shalt give life for life. Okay, if the woman died, then the man, this man that hurt her, he, he's going to die. Eye for eye, he poked at her eye, he's going to get his eye poked out. Tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. All right, and then it goes on with some other, other judgments. And so the point that I'm making there isn't about whether or not it should have been the death penalty because the b baby was in the womb. Some have tried to bring that out of this text, but I don't believe that's what it's saying. But regardless, the point that I'm making is simply that the husband was the one who had the right to say what shall be done because of the woman's body. So that's kind of interesting. Just keep that in mind. All right, so let me uh, just start here. Who is in charge of your body? Now, when we're born, were any of us really in charge of our body when we were born? Wouldn't that be weird? You know, you expect a child to just take care of their own body. Uh, Psalm 127, let's go there. We won't be coming back to Exodus, so you can lose that. 127, Psalm, and verse 3 and 4. Psalm 127. Verse 3 and 4, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Okay, so that baby that's inside the woman's uh, uh, womb is a reward from God. Okay, so therefore, it belongs to those parents while it's a child. <clears throat> and what if we said, you know, the, obviously the Bible gives us responsibility to care for the kids, right? Train up a child the way they should go, and when they're old, they're not depart from it. Uh, lots of instructions about training up the children. 1 Timothy 5a says if you don't provide for your family, then you're worse than an infidel. So we're, we have to take care of them and provide for them, protect them, and do all those things, which means that their body belongs to us, and we have the right to tell them what to do with their body. But what if a child said, or what if, uh, what if I said, it's my child's body, they can decide what they want to do with it. If they don't want to get education, then they don't have to do school. If they don't want to eat what I tell them to eat, no big deal. If they don't want to wear clothes, they just want to run around naked outside, everything, you know, that's up to them. It's their body. They don't want to wear clothes. And if I just had that kind of mindset, everybody would think that's ridiculous, okay? So from being born and being a child, ultimately, your body wasn't your own. Your parents had to tell you what to do with that body, when to go to bed and get some sleep, and when to do uh, different things uh, to your body. Uh, whether or not you could get even, you know, with Sharice, we didn't let her get her ears pierced. And some people were like, what? Why wouldn't you get her pierced? We got our baby's ear pierced whenever they're ever. Well, here's the, the reason why. Uh, number one, we didn't necessarily have a problem with girls getting their ears pierced, but we realized that one day she might have a conviction that says, like, I just don't think God would want me to do that. And then we wanted it to be her choice. But right now, if she said, no, I want to get it done now, you know, we knew, hey, you might not want to later, so we're going to say no. And she never did. She never did ask for that or complain about that. But that was just the case until she got older, and then finally she did get her ears pierced. But we just, we, we had the right to say no. If she said, hey, I want to go out and get a tattoo, we got the right to say no. If she said, I want to eat all kinds of junk food, and I don't want to eat any vegetables, we have the right to say no. You know, we actually had control over her body. So what about whenever you grow up and you move out of the house, you get married? You know, the Bible says that your body is not your own when you're married. The, body sa the Bible says that uh, married people, they have a responsibility to provide for their bodies of their spouse. Okay, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let uh, every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband, 
uh, the wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also, the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Now, I've all, I remember reading that thinking, being real confused. Like, how does the man not have power over his body because he's married? And I think the idea isn't necessarily like you physically don't have power over your own body. The idea is that it's not yours anymore. You know, you have to subject, you're subject to the wife, and the wife is subject to the husband. Obviously, the husband's in charge of the family as far as an authority and uh, that kind of a structure. But when it comes to providing and, you know, uh, being intimate or it comes to, like, even taking care of yourself, all those kinds of things, uh, you know, your spouse has a say in that. Could you imagine getting married and then, the you know, the wife says, right after they say I do and they kiss the bride and they go off and the, and the, and the wife says, now, hope you don't expect to get intimate with me. I'm not into that. Don't want to do that. I'm grossed out by that. And so, you know, we just have to stay in separate bedrooms or, or whatever. Look, today, there are some people that would be like, hey, that's all right. That's her choice. You know, she has a right to do that. And actually, I've heard of cases where, you know, the wife, uh, you know, takes the husband to court because he raped her or something like that. And I'm not trying to give men, you know, the right to, to harm their wives or something like that. No, that's, that's your responsibility to take care of that body. And, uh, but in, the case, in this case, like, it's absurd. Like, the, the Bible literally says that when they come together, that wife's body is not her own anymore. It belongs to the husband. That husband's body is not his own anymore. It belongs to the wife. And so they uh, have that obligation, that responsibility to care for one another. Look at Hosea chapter 3. What if a man said, you know, what if a, what if a man or a woman, either, either way, but what if they went out and committed adultery and when they came home, you know, the spouse said, where have you been? And they find out they committed adultery and they said, it's my body, it's my choice. Let me see here. Hosea, Joel, Amos. Hosea chapter 3. You remember the story, we went through this a while back, uh, where Hosea had to marry a woman of whoredoms. And so she ran off and played the whore and went to other men, and he had to go get her and bring her back. And chapter 3, verse 3 says, And I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me many days, thou shalt not play the harlot, and thou shalt not be for another man, so will I be for thee. He's like, look, I am yours and you are mine. We, you know, we belong to each other. And so really, even when you're married, your body isn't completely yours. You're not in charge of your body. And I already mentioned that verse from Exodus 21, you know, where the husband even had the right to, de to decide what happened to the woman. And so uh, who is in charge of your body? And if, when you were born, you weren't in charge of your body. Your parents were. When you get married... You're not in charge of your body. Your spouse is. Uh, ultimately, um, you're not. You're when you're married. You're not. You're not in charge. I believe, to some degree, it would even include, like, if your spouse says, "I really don't like." I'm gonna get myself in trouble here. <laughs> if my spouse says, "I really don't want you to wear that shirt anymore," and I say, "I'm comfortable in that shirt. I'm gonna wear the shirt." which, by the way, is a true story, okay? Quite honestly, I, she's my wife, so I have a responsibility to her. I think it's right now, obviously, you know, there's something that could be said about, about that, but ultimately, I should say, well, sure, what would you like me to wear? You know, within reason, i got to obey God rather than a man, and that would include my wife, so I'm not going to, like, sin or do something that's against my conscience before God, but... If she said, I want you to wear this type of clothing, or I don't like you to wear that shirt, I don't like the way it looks, or whatever. Or how about this? What if we said we didn't you know, necessarily like the way each other looked? Hey, I think you need to go on a diet. I think you need to start restricting you. Go get some exercise or something like that. Now, who in the world would say that to their spouse, right? But let's say that it was a legitimate thing, and you really wanted that, and you sat down and had a talk with the other person. They should be willing to do that. You say, well, that's not fair. It's my body. Well, no, it's actually my body. And, uh, and vice versa, okay? And so uh, uh, we do have that right. I believe it's biblical, and I believe it makes sense even from a standpoint of just that relationship. 
Now, I won't spend much time on this one. Uh, there are verses that we could go to, but uh, I, I'm just not going to go there. But uh, our jobs, in a manner of speaking, like when we go to work for somebody, and the Bible t- uses the words servants and masters, uh, we wouldn't want to think of it that way with our employer. But if we go to job for somebody and uh, and they you know, tell us, hey, this is what you're going to wear, this is what you're going to do, uh, to a certain extent, don't they have control over our bodies? And so in that situation, you don't even, you're not even in charge of your body in that situation. Okay, how about uh, number four here? When you get saved, this is an important one. Are you in charge of your body after you get saved? Look at 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, I've pointed out before many times, I've read this scripture and other scriptures that deal with our body being the temple, and I've pointed out the fact that it's plural. He's talking to the church. And so as a church, you're the temple of God. As the church, you know, God can tell you what to do uh, and, and all that. And, and that is definitely, I still stand by that. But here, I believe that each, because the church, obviously, we're a, we're a family, but we're made up of individuals. And so obviously here when he says, so glorify God in your body, and in your spirit, uh, which are God's, I don't think it's necessarily meaning, you know, that only applies to us whenever we're one body together. Obviously, he's saying as church members, as believers, as as those who have the Holy Spirit, we're to glorify God in our bodies and our spirits, which are God's. So do we have control over our body? If God says, no, I don't want you to do that, doesn't he have that responsibility, I mean, that, that authority and that prerogative to tell us not to do something with our body? We're, we belong to him, right? That's, uh, now, he didn't, uh, praise the Lord, I mean, he paid, he purchased us, but salvation was a free gift. And so if we choose not to follow him and not to do uh, the things that he wants us to do, uh, then ultimately we, we're going to get away with it for a time. And the same is true for a wife who, you know, wants to do whatever with her own body or she wants to commit adultery or she wants to do something else, you know, obviously she has that right to be able to do that to some extent. Uh, I mean, not that right, but she has that ability to, to make that own ch- her own choice and do that. Children have that, that, op- that, that you know, uh, ability to go out and go against their parents and not do with their bodies what their parents tell them to do. Obviously, From one standpoint, and this is kind of more of the conclusion, but from one standpoint, well, of course, it's our body and our choice. We do have a choice, but in God's eyes, does that mean that we can really just do whatever uh, we want? So look at Romans chapter 12. When we get saved, our bodies should be uh, something that according to God's word, something that he gets glory from. And the passage I just read, the verse before that said, flee fornication, right? Do, don't do things that uh, would be disrespectful to the body uh, and to God. Now, it didn't, now obviously, uh, even committing adultery would obviously be against God, but adultery is more of a sin against that, against the spouse, right? But fornication is a sin against yourself, the Bible says, and it's a sin against God. God says, don't do that. Glorify, that's when he goes on to say, your bodies are the temple. Your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. Okay, go to uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I've been studying Romans a lot this week because tomorrow I'm going to preach a message on a bird's eye view of Romans. And the idea was to kind of give like an outline of Romans. Well, you know, people have spent, their entire ministry, like writing an outline on the book of Romans, and I'm trying to do it in one week. <laughs> it's not uh, not going to actually come out quite as well as some of those people that spent their whole life in it. Uh, but uh, I've read it, been reading it this week over and over and studying it and thinking about different things. Okay, so here's what it says in chapter 12. 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Okay, we owe it to God. It's reasonable that he would want us to give our bodies to him. How do you want me to use my body, Lord? It's yours to do with what you would like. Okay, so, again, in one sense, you are in charge of your body. Yes, you can make decisions for yourself. If you want to make the claim, my body, my choice, I can do with what I want. You're right, in one sense, it is your body. You can do with it what you want. But that doesn't take away from the judgment that shall come from those who actually have control over your body, okay? So let me give you some examples. <clears throat> if you say it's my, it's, it's my body, it's my choice, I will murder my child. Do you have the, the ability to do that? Sure you do. You know, and there's people that have, uh, they haven't gone to the doctors to do it. You know, I suppose, uh, look, this is how law, this is how uh, politics always go. There's some libertarian out there that'll say, like, well, if you legalize drugs, you know, then, then people won't do all these crazy things in order to get them because, uh, because you know, and, and, and so if you, you know, you know, the idea, like, if they ban guns, people are still going to go out and get guns. We understand that. And so if you ban drugs and people are going to still go get drugs, then why not just open it up? Well, to, at some point, that starts looking like anarchy. So there has to be law. There has to be some restrictions, obviously. You know, uh, but what if, uh, you know, the, the, you know, thankfully now we do have this law saying that, hey, uh, and I guess not necessarily law, but it's saying that the, the states have to decide uh, whether or not a, wo a woman can, you know, commit this, this uh act of, of sin, I, I believe, you know, obviously. But, you know, if a woman wanted to, even if every single state says, no, we're, we're going to ban it, it's not allowed, any doctor that is found performing this procedure is going to lose their license, uh, whatever the case, you know what, there's going to be some black market, it's still people that are going to do it. People are going to figure out what they can drink or what kind of exercise they can do to miscarry or, or whatever. People are going to find a way to do it. And so what if they decide, oh, yeah, well, it's my body. Watch this. I'm going to do it anyway. Okay, well, fine. But you're still going to stand before God. You're still going to be judged. You're still going to pay the consequences on your own body and, and on your spouse or whoever, your parents or whoever it is that is affected by this. It's your body, but ultimately you will be judged. What if you are a child and you say, well, I just don't like what my parents tell me I can and can't do. I'm going to run away from home and I'm just going to do my own thing anyway. Well, you have the ability to do that. But at the end of the day, you're going to be judged by God. You're going to be judged by your parents once you're found out. You're going to be judged by the, the, the law whenever they find you and put you in juvie. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? There's always consequences to taking the liberty to do with your body what you want to do. If, you commit, if you're unmarried and you commit fornication, you have the ability to do that, sure. But you're going to be judged, not by our law system, because our, our, our law doesn't care about that sin, uh, but, uh, but you'll be judged by God, and you'll be judged by the parents, you know, that are involved or, or whatever the case. If you commit adultery and you're married, you're going to be judged. You might think, oh, I have the ability to do that. Nobody can tell me what to do with my body, but you're going to be judged, judged by God, judged by your husband, judged by, uh, by whatever. I know a case, I don't know, I'm sure people in here have heard about it, but I know a case where a pastor friend of mine, uh, supposedly, I don't know all the things that have come out yet, but supposedly uh, found out his wife was having, a, having an affair and ended up getting a gun and killing the guy. And uh, I don't know all the details, so that's all I can say about that. But, uh, but you know what the Bible actually says, and I can't remember what, what verse it is, but the Bible actually tells us and warns us that that is an action that is probably going to happen whenever somebody commits adultery. The, the jealousy of that husband is going to get mad, and he's going and he's quite possibly going to do that. Uh, I can't remember the verse, so I'm totally just paraphrasing it, but the, uh, there's going to be judgments for it. You say, well, yeah, what's well, my body? Yeah, but it's affecting other people, and there's somebody who has that authority to judge. If nobody else, God has that authority to judge over what you do with your body. If you want to be unhealthy and harm your body, 
you can do that. I mean, you have the ability to do that, uh, but ultimately it will affect somebody and somebody will judge you for that. Man, I got done super early. I guess it's because I thought originally that we were going to be having a business meeting, but uh, uh, that's all I got for you tonight. So you are obviously have the ability to do with your body what you want, but the reality is from God's perspective, your body's not yours. So quit saying the my body, my choice thing. Not that anybody else, not that anybody in here is saying that. But from a biblical perspective, that's what I believe. Let's pray. Father, thank you uh, that you have given us freedoms and liberties. You've given us free will. You've given us the ability to do with our bodies what we want to a degree. But help us to realize as Christians and as husbands and wives and as uh, children, whatever our situation is, help us to realize that our bodies aren't really our own, but there's somebody responsible uh, that, that we have a responsibility to give ourselves to and give our bodies to. I pray that you help us do that and remember that and we, uh, help us to give our bodies to you to do with what you would want, you, you would have us do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, let's.